Welcome to Downtown Hamilton. As usual, this video was designed as an aid to exploration. Log off the computer, pull up this video on your phone, and go for a walk. Each time I'm done talking about a building, I'll throw up a map to get you to the next one. Pause the video and take a stroll. Indeed, feel free to wander off script for a while. I'll still be there when you get to the next site, and there's always another side street to explore. The city of Hamilton was founded in 1816 by George Hamilton, an early settler in the Niagara region, who had convinced the government of Upper Canada to establish the courthouse for the Gore District on his property, and laid out a town site around the courthouse as a speculative investment. Despite the presence of the courthouse, however, initial growth was slow, with Dundas serving as the main commercial centre in the region straight through the 1820s. Growth began in earnest in the 1830s, when Hamilton exploded as a transportation hub for British and American settlers passing through to establish themselves in new farms in the interior of southwestern Ontario. Histories of the town during this period emphasize its rough and tumble nature, painting images of rampant prostitution and widespread public drunkenness. But it was also during this period that many of Hamilton's enduring institutions were established. The Gore Bank, the first bank to operate in southwestern Ontario, was established in Hamilton in 1836, and within a generation had established branches in Guelph, Woodstock, Simcoe, and a number of other growing settlements west of Hamilton. Two decades later, in 1853, the Great Western Railway established itself in Hamilton, connecting the young city to the region through an extensive network of railway lines stretching from Niagara Falls to Windsor and establishing both its offices and its maintenance shops in Hamilton. By the time of Canadian Confederation, Hamilton had established itself as a financial and distribution centre for the western portions of Ontario and a growing industrial centre. The establishment of a growing steel industry and a number of major American branch plants in the city's east end cemented Hamilton's importance and a cluster of impressive office buildings spurted up in the area surrounding Gore Park. The middle of the 20th century was hard on downtown Hamilton, as it was on many downtowns across the Rust Belt. Hamilton, however, suffered particularly acute architectural loss as eight blocks of the downtown west of James Street were destroyed in 1968 and 1969 in the name of urban renewal. East of James Street, however, downtown Hamilton remains vibrant and alive and frequently rewards exploration. Our walk today begins at Gore Park on the southeast corner of James and King Streets. Gore Park's triangular shape dates to the city's first town plan crafted by George Hamilton. Having arranged for the courthouse to be erected on land he owned, Hamilton had agreed with his neighbor, Nathaniel Hugson, that they would lay out a town site on the boundary between their two properties. The central park around which the town would be laid out was expected to consist of a triangular slice of Hamilton's land matched with an adjacent triangular slice of Hugson's land to the north. Hugson, however, backed out at the last minute, electing instead to divide the entirety of his property into building plots. The triangle of land Hamilton had left to the city bearing his name was later used as a garbage dump and briefly considered as the site of a public market and a number of developments. It wasn't until 1873 that the city landscaped the area as a public park, although long before that point it had been transformed into one in practice. The fountain in the centre of the park, for instance, was erected in 1859 in celebration of the establishment of the city's first waterworks. In the century and a half since Gore Park was established, the park has solidified its place as Hamilton's chief public space, festooned with monuments to public figures, and used as a gathering place during public events. Walk a block east along King Street to Hugson Street. The building on the northwest corner of King and Hugson was built between 1891 and 1893 as the Wright House, Hamilton's first department store selling ladies' apparel. The construction had taken so long because the architect, William Stewart, had been instructed that the Wright House not be obliged to close at any point during construction, with the first sections of the new building opening to the public before the last sections of the old building were demolished. The Art Deco building across Hudson Street from the Wright House was built in 1930 as the home of the American five and dime chain, S.S. Craigsey. The modern buildings, now standing on the south side of Gore Park at Hudson, stand on the site of two of Hamilton's earliest banks. The southwest corner of Hudson and King was once home to the head offices of the Gore Bank, the first bank to establish itself in southwestern Ontario. Designed by Brantford architect John Turner, the structure was erected in 1836, the same year the bank was founded. Like many of the region's earliest banks, the building could easily be mistaken for an upper-class residence of its era, partially because the bank's purpose was seen in the context of providing capital for major commercial and industrial ventures, not individual banking. 
It wasn't until later in the 19th century that banks came to take on a more consciously institutional architecture, a move coincident with a movement to extend banking services to small businesses and eventually private individuals. The Gore Bank invested heavily in the early development of Hamilton and the Niagara and Grand River regions, but overextended itself and was forced to accept a buyout from the upstart Bank of Commerce in 1869. The building remained a bank branch until 1923 and was demolished in 1928. Across the street from the Gore Bank, on the southeast corner of King and Hudson, was the home of the Hamilton Provident and Loan. Established in 1859, the new bank was reflective of contemporary trends in serving a far larger number of far smaller clients than the Gore Bank. The focus on small businessmen was extended even further with the establishment of an associated personal savings bank in 1871. Their new head offices, erected in 1880 to plans by Toronto architect David Dick, reflected the success of this new model of banking and was at the time of construction far and away the most impressive structure on Gore Park. The impressive Second Empire building, however, was unfortunately demolished in 1961. Continue walking east along King Street to the intersection of King and John Streets. The Art Deco building on the southwest corner of King and John was Hamilton's sixth post office when built and the city's second post office at King and John Streets. Its immediate predecessor was an ornate, if somewhat ungangly, Romanesque structure erected in 1883 to plans provided by Thomas Fuller, the chief architect of the Department of Public Works in Ottawa. The structure's clock tower soared over Gore Park at the time. As Hamilton grew in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it became increasingly obvious that the city's post office needed to be expanded as well, and in 1934, federal money for infrastructure projects designed to provide work during the Great Depression were taken advantage of to erect a building over four times the size of the old post office. At the time, a significant portion of the public argued in favour of the incorporation of at least some portion of the Victorian post office into the new structure. But the architects, Hutton and Souter, felt that an entirely new building could take better advantage of the site they had been provided with. The 1936 building is a fine example of its style, featuring excellent stone carving above the John Street entrance and in a band between the second and third floors. The block of King Street east of the post office has been home to some of Hamilton's finest hotels. The movement to erect a luxury hotel in Hamilton began in earnest in 1855, when a group of businessmen from the city established the Anglo-American Hotel for that purpose. Designed by George Sparks, an architect from Buffalo, the impressive Italianate building was opened in 1856 with spectacular ceremony and was reflective of the place Hamilton aspired to hold as a major North American center. The hotel, however, while in line with Hamilton's ambitions, was decades ahead of Hamilton's capacity to support and struggled to fill its rooms from the day it was opened. Following a reception for the Prince of Wales when he toured North America in 1860, the hotel's managers apparently felt it best to end on a high note and slipped out of town the night after the prince departed, leaving the city's business community to close the hotel and pick up the bill. Half a century later, in 1916, the former Anglo-American hotel was demolished to make way for the Royal Conneaut, a 12-story Edwardian hotel built of red brick with stone highlights, which, like the Anglo-American, was dramatically larger and more luxurious than any hotel operating in the city at the time. Unlike the Anglo-American, however, the Royal Conneaut was a financial success, and in 1931, the Hamilton architectural firm of Hutton & Souter was commissioned to design an extension of the hotel towards John Street that nearly doubled the hotel's square footage. Elegant inside and out, the structure continued to serve as the city's finest hotel into the 21st century, but has recently been extensively renovated into an apartment complex. East of the Royal Conneaut, on the southeast corner of King and Catherine Streets, is the site of the terminal building, once the meeting point of all Hamilton's radio railways. When the Cataract Power Company brought plentiful electricity to Hamilton for the first time in 1898, the company's directors immediately laid out plans to harness their new access to cheap electricity to the fullest by buying up the small electric railways which radiated out from Hamilton. Those companies operated as privately run streetcar lines within the city limits, running on city streets and stopping frequently. Beyond the city limits, however, they operated as small electric railways, reaching out to destinations like Oakville, Grimsby, and Brantford. With the consolidation of the region's radio railways, the electrical company proceeded with the construction of a large terminal structure at King and Catherine, designed by local architect Charles Mill in 1906. The four-story structure was built with a foundation which would have allowed it to serve as the base of the city's first skyscraper, although no such development ever occurred 
and with the decline in the mid-20th century of streetcars and radio railways alike, the building was first put to use as the city's bus terminal before being demolished outright in 1958. Walk north a block and a half on John Street. Along the way, notice Treble Hall at 8 John Street, built as Larkin Hall in 1879 to plans by Hamilton architect John Balfour. When built, the entire upper floor was given over to one of the city's largest auditoriums. Stop at the fire hall on the west side of John Street, just north of King William. Hamilton had possessed a volunteer fire department from its earliest days, but in its modern form, the department dates to 1870 and the appointment of Alexander Atchison as fire chief. Atchison set himself up as an autocrat, demanding strict order within the fire department and replacing the volunteer fire department with a professional one. He instituted the use of uniforms among firemen and insisted upon regular drills. Under Atchison, the Hamilton Fire Department was also the first in Canada to install fire poles and stations to reduce response time and adopt chemical suppressants which could be sprayed onto fires. Today's Central Fire Hall was erected in 1913 to plans by the architectural firm of Stewart and Witten. Return south to King William Street and turn right, walking a block west on King William to James Street. Across James Street, where the Jackson Square Mall stands today, is the site of Hamilton's first and second city halls. The land on which they stood had been donated to the municipality by Andrew Miller in 1837 to serve as a public market. And in 1839, a market hall was erected on the site with a large hall above, which was used, among many other things, for the meeting of the town council. With the growth of the town, the building rapidly became inadequate both as a market building and as a municipal building. Acquisition of additional open space for market vendors and the addition of a bell tower to the building in 1872 only served to highlight the municipal building's inadequacies. Relief came in the 1880s when two new buildings were erected, a city hall on James Street and a market building behind the city hall. The new city hall was designed by Hamilton's leading architect, James Balfour, and took three years to build from 1887 to 1890. An impressive Romanesque building, the new city hall featured imposing entrances on both James Street and Market Square, along with a monumental clock tower which dominated the intersection for 70 years. Behind the city hall was erected a new market building, designed in 1886 by William Arthur Edwards. An elaborately ornate structure, the building housed dozens of market stalls and modern facilities featuring refrigeration and concrete floors. The city also paved the formerly dirt outdoor market surrounding the market building. The 1886 market was destroyed by fire in 1917 and was replaced by a series of inadequate structures, the last of which incorporated the market into the ground floor of a parking garage. The city hall, however, survived into the 1960s. The need for a new city hall was widely felt as early as the 1920s, but budgetary concerns meant that a new building was repeatedly put off for decades. Even when new construction couldn't be put off any longer, however, public affection for the old city hall proved one last stumbling block, and the old city hall came very close to being preserved for posterity. Close, but not close enough, and the structure meant the wrecking ball in early 1961. Across the street from the old city hall, on the northeast corner of James and King William Streets, is the Lister Block. Built in 1923, the building was noted at the time for the speed of its construction, being open for occupation a matter of months after the previous 1886 Lister Chambers were destroyed by fire. The building features an L-shaped arcade and terracotta ornamentation. At one point facing the threat of demolition, the Lister Block has recently been renovated to house offices for Hamilton civic government. Walk a block north to the Federal Building at 72 James Street North. The Federal Building was erected in 1856 as Hamilton's first dedicated post office. Only a fraction of the original facade survives, consisting of the central portion of the bottom three floors. When the post office was moved to Gore Park in 1886, the old structure became fortuitously available to house the city government, while the new city hall was being erected a block south on James Street. The building then began the first of its two transformations when the Sun Life Assurance Company hired William Stewart to transform it into their regional head offices. The building's facade was dramatically altered with the addition of substantial wings on both the north and south end of the building. The structure was transformed yet again in 1920 when an additional two stories were added to the top of the building. Return south on James Street to the intersection of James and King. The head of Gore Park, on the southwest corner of James and King, was once home to the head offices of the Bank of Hamilton, the last major financial institution founded in Hamilton, with its head offices in the city from 1872 to 1924. The bank moved to the intersection of James and King in 1892, erecting an ornate three-story building. 
In 1907, the bank hired Charles Mill to replace the office building's top story with an additional six, making the eight-story head office one of the city's tallest buildings at the time. The structure stood until 1985, when it was demolished to make room for the present complex. Further south, on the east side of James Street, south of Gore Park, was the Canada Life Assurance Building. Once among the finest office buildings in Canada, the structure was designed by Buffalo architect Richard Waite and was built of Connecticut sandstone in an effort to absorb the soot of the growing industrial city. Magnificent building, the structure rose to a jagged roof line topped by a clock tower visible across the city. Despite a series of owners, the building was treated with remarkable care throughout its existence and in 1929 the roof line was even rebuilt nearly exactly as before when the upper stories were destroyed in a fire. It came as no surprise then that when the building's demolition was proposed in the 1970s, public opinion was firmly against the decision, with substantial protests surrounding the destruction. None of the protests mattered, however, and in 1972, one of Hamilton's finest landmarks was destroyed. Slightly further south, on the west side of James Street, is the Pickett Building. Designed by the architectural firm of Prack & Prack, at 18 stories, the building was the tallest in Hamilton when completed, dominating the city skyline. The structure was built as a speculative real estate investment by J.M. Pickett and completed in 1927. Modeled on similar structures in New York City, the Pickett Building represented a number of Hamilton firsts. The first building in the city to rise taller than 10 stories, the first building in the city to cost more than a million dollars, and the first building in the city to be built with a modern steel frame skeleton. In a move pioneered in New York, the Pickett Building celebrates its height with Gothic ornamentation emphasizing its vertical lines and substantial ornamentation on both the base and the crown of the building. If you're taking the walk during working hours, I highly recommend stepping into the structure's lobby. Immediately south of the Pickett Building, on the northwest corner of James and Main, is the Federal Life Assurance Building. Built in 1905, indicative of a classical strain of skyscraper construction in North America, the metaphor used at the time was of a classical column with a heavy, ornamented base, in this case the bottom two stories, and an equally ornamented crown separated by a relatively plain shaft. The intersection of James and Main is one of the city's best, giving the pedestrian an opportunity to step back into Hamilton's financial district of the early 20th century. Across the street from the Federal Life Assurance Building, on the northeast corner of James and Main, is the Landed Banking and Loan Building, built in 1908 to plans by Hamilton architect Charles Mills. Mills, however, had modeled his own plans nearly exactly on those of Stanford White's widely admired Knickerbocker building in New York City. Across Main Street from the Landed Banking and Loan Building, on the southeast corner of James and Main, is the Hamilton Club, established in 1873 as a social club for the city's business elite. In that year, the club hired local architect William Leaf to expand and modify an existing residence as the club's new home and over the next 40 years, at least three other architectural firms would be called upon to expand and renovate the structure into the current clubhouse. Finally, the southwest corner of James and Main is home to the Bank of Montreal building, erected in 1928 to plans by Kenneth Guscote Ria, a classical temple containing one of the finest banking halls in Ontario. The new bank was regarded as a statement of faith in a growing city by one of the country's largest financial institutions. The Bank of Montreal departed part of the site in 1972 but the structure has found a new use as the home of a law firm and remains in excellent shape. Immediately south of the Bank of Montreal is St. Paul's Presbyterian Church, the city's oldest Presbyterian congregation, originally established as St. Andrews in the 1830s. With the growth of the congregation, the present structure was erected in 1854 to plans by William Thomas, an important early Toronto architect. In 1873, as a result of a dispute within the parish, the congregation split in two temporarily and when it recombined in 1876, it did so with the new name of St. Paul's. The building features excellent stonework on the exterior and a magnificent interior, which you are strongly encouraged to step into if the opportunity presents itself. South of St. Paul's Presbyterian Church is the facade of the James Street Baptist Church. The church was designed by Joseph Connolly in 1879 and is notable as the only Protestant church designed by a man best known for his close connections with the Ontario's Roman Catholic community. The majority of the church was demolished in 2014, but the facade and tower were retained. A residential tower is planned to be erected behind them. Building by building, we've wandered three blocks south from our last map by this point. Turn left, walking a block east on Jackson Street, then turn right, walking a block south on James Street to Hunter. The six-story building terminating James Street is the former Toronto, Hamilton and Buffalo Railway Station. The Toronto, Hamilton and Buffalo Railway 
was organized in an attempt to break the monopoly the Grand Trunk Railway had established on rail service between Toronto and Buffalo. But the money for its construction came from two railway networks, the Canadian Pacific and the New York Central, who wanted to use it to extend their respective networks. The Canadian Pacific saw their connection with the TH&B at Hamilton as a crucial link connecting them to a variety of American railways at Buffalo. The New York Central, on the other hand, saw the THNB as a connection to Toronto, and hence the final link in the provision of through trains from Toronto to New York, Boston, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland. In its final form, the railway ran from Fort Erie through Hamilton and Brantford to a connection with the New York Central at Waterford. For its Hamilton terminal, the Toronto, Hamilton, and Buffalo hired William Stewart to design an ornate Queen Anne structure with a whimsical roofline culminating in a circular tower overlooking the railway tracks. The 1895 station stood significantly further west, fronting onto James Street, and served as one of Hamilton's primary gateways for nearly four decades before being replaced in 1933 with the present Art Deco structure designed by the firm of Fellheimer and Wagner. Alfred Fellheimer had been the lead architect for New York Central's Grand Central Station in 1903, and later gone on to design many of the New York Central Railway's most impressive passenger facilities, including those in Utica, Buffalo, and Cincinnati. The structure continues to serve as a railway station, serving as the western terminal for Toronto's commuter rail network. Turn around and return two blocks north along Hudson Street to Main Street. The block bounded by Hudson, Main, John, and Jackson Streets, on the southeast corner of Hudson and Main, was set aside for a courthouse in Hamilton's earliest town plans. The first courthouse on the site was a simple log structure, but it was replaced in 1832 with Hamilton's second courthouse, an imposing Palladian structure which was, at the time, far and away the largest structure in Hamilton. In the city's earliest days, the courthouse served multiple duties, acting as a town meeting place and serving as the first place of worship for several denominations while they established themselves enough to construct their own churches. Imposing though it was, however, the 1832 courthouse was simply not equipped to handle the judicial needs of a settlement which in the 19th century transformed itself from a frontier town into an industrial city. In 1877, therefore, the County of Wentworth authorized the construction of Hamilton's third courthouse, an impressive Second Empire structure designed by local architect Charles Villar Mulligan. The structure featured a symmetric facade, with a clock tower and Palladian window fronting onto an ornate courtroom. The building, however, was not designed with expansion in mind, a shortcoming which became obvious nearly immediately. The provision of only a single courtroom meant that several cases could not be tried simultaneously, delaying cases unnecessarily, frequently for months. The demolition of the 1879 courthouse was by no means a foregone conclusion, however. Expansion plans were repeatedly put forward, many of which retained most or all of the Victorian building. Indeed, in the 1950s, a collection of the city's lawyers made a public case in favour of retaining the structure in which they did much of their work, but in vain. The new courthouse, designed by the firm of Prack & Prack, is an excellent work of modern architecture, with particularly notable stone carving on the building's main street facade. Walk two blocks west along Main Street to McNabb. The church on the northeast corner of Main and McNabb was built as Centenary Methodist Church in 1866. The building, designed by Albert Harvey Hill, housed the city's largest Methodist congregation and was capable of comfortably seating more than a thousand individuals. The congregation became Centenary United with the creation of the United Church of Canada in 1925. Hamilton's first public library, established in 1899, stood immediately east of Centenary Methodist. The public library movement in late 19th century Ontario viewed itself as the successor to the region's mechanics institutes, institutions which had spread throughout the British Empire in the mid-19th century, and which provided members with reading rooms, extensive libraries, theatre, and lectures on a variety of topics. Attempted to keep fees low, however, many mechanics institutes struggled financially and frequently were forced to close. Provincial legislation, passed in 1882, allowed municipalities to support free libraries of their own, although it would be another seven years before Hamilton hired William Stewart to design the city's first library building, a picturesque riot of ornamental details. With the growth of the city of Hamilton, the old library was deemed inadequate, and a new structure was erected on the southwest corner of Main and McNabb Streets, financed by the Carnegie Foundation. An imposing classical building, the new library featured recent innovations in library design, including bookshelves open to the public. In the old library, books had to be ordered and retrieved by the librarians from closed stacks. The new library also boasted a children's library. With the further growth of the city, the Hamilton Public Library moved into its third and current central branch in 1980. But unlike the first library, the Carnegie Library was preserved, finding a new use as Hamilton's family court. Immediately west of the old library building is Hamilton's current city hall, 
erected in 1960 to plans by Stanley Roscoe. Widely regarded as one of the best examples of mid-century architecture in southwestern Ontario, the seven-story building was originally faced in white marble and presides over a substantial plaza. We've come to the end of our walk. To return to the beginning of the walk, head two blocks east on Main Street to James, then turn left and walk a block north on James Street to King. Alternately, you could head towards the escarpment, spending a day wandering through the attractive residential streets of Duran to the south. Thank you.